This morning we're going to be looking at uh, Luke's Gospel, the Gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 24. This has been resting with me for a while because I thought I was preaching it two weeks ago uh, and I got the dates wrong. <laughs> Luckily you had the right man preaching and it wasn't me. But this is the week ordained, Luke 24. And we're going to be reading from verse 36 to 49. Just a bit of context. When you hit a passage that says, while they were, you want to know who they are. So in this passage of verse 36, it says, while they were still talking. These are the disciples who are meeting in a room and they've just had some correspondence arrive from Emmaus or the road to Emmaus. And these correspondents, as it were, well, they were also followers of Jesus, but they were, they were passing on a message that they had encountered the risen Lord on their journey. So that's who they were. They were the people who were recounting meeting Jesus. Well, and remember, at this point in time, Jesus had died and been raised from the dead and was appearing in various ways. So while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Back when we lived in the Forest of Dean, we had some interesting neighbours. One house in particular seemed to attract the wrong kind of people. Not our house, <laughs> you'll be pleased to know. Just across the road from us, for a while, lived someone who was eventually convicted of burglary. Incidentally, he was stealing things from people within a quarter of a mile radius. They were posting that they were going away on holiday on Facebook. So he used that as an opportunity to steal from them. So be careful what you post. You never know who's listening. And then a second chap moves into the house after this guy gets convicted and sent down. So it's one of those houses. And this chap was later convicted of dealing drugs just across the road from us. And while this second chap was going about his work, and there's a, there's a long story here, I'll keep it brief, the other neighbours, including myself, decided to keep a close eye on them. And so we did. We noted down his visitors, we noted down car registration numbers, so that we could pass it all on to the police, because we knew that they were interested in him. One day, this guy had a blazing row with one of his nicer neighbours. Now, I was alone in the house, and I was about to go out and pick up the children from a party. And I heard a crash and I went to the window and I saw the nice neighbor's car with its windscreen smashed. And this chap was just standing there. And then he took a run up at the car and gave it a boot, literally with his boot, twice. So hard that the door caved in. And then he calmly walked off. Now I had to leave at that point, so I put down my binoculars. <laughs> I didn't actually, I didn't need binoculars. I didn't need them. It was that close. But I had to leave at that point. So I went out. I picked up the children. I came back. When the children were safely at home, 
I wandered over and I said to her, I saw all of it. If you need a witness, I'm your man. And then I went back. I got my notebook out with all the car registration numbers and I wrote down exactly what happened. I didn't write down what I thought had happened, which is I thought he smashed the windscreen. I didn't see him. I just wrote down what I saw, word for word. The police did visit about a few days later and they said, you, we heard you saw what happened. Could you give us a te testimony of what happened? So I said, yes, just wait a minute. And I went out and got my notebook out. And this police officer's face just dropped. <laughs> he was not used to that level of wit. I was like, well, it's here. It's he said, can I take a photograph? Yeah, you can. So he took a photograph of, of all these words. See, I'm, I get a bit geeky about things. And it's got to be done right. It's got to be done right. Um, so he was very impressed. Anyway, it went to court, criminal damage and the guy pleaded guilty. I didn't need to go to court because he pleaded guilty. And anyway, the testimony had all been written down by hand that day. They didn't need me to come in. Eventually, he was sent down for a number of other things. But my neighbor, at that point in time, needed a witness, a reliable witness, a good witness. And that was something I could help out with at that point in time. And it looks like Jesus needs just that. Our reading finds the group of disciples together in one place, having just heard from the disciples who had met Jesus on their journey. Now, these two followers told the others all about this meeting and the meal that they shared with Jesus. But not before the 11 disciples were already saying, they were already saying this, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. So you've got the accounts of these two followers of Jesus who've seen Jesus on the road to Emmaus. You've got the fact that the disciples are already saying, well, the Lord has truly been raised because he's appeared to Simon Peter. And they're swapping eyewitness testimony of the risen Jesus when the risen Jesus appears amongst them and proclaims peace. And they say, well, we knew you'd be here because we believe that you've been raised from the dead. Well, actually, they didn't say that. <laughs> they didn't. And we'll come to that later. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, peace be with you. Now, this is quite a familiar greeting in Jewish circles, and certainly at the time of Jesus. Peace be with you. But if you're like me, and you want to get into the depths of things, Luke has a special place in his heart for the word peace. In fact, in many gospel accounts, you will hear peace being spoken of at the birth of Jesus. Peace on earth. Peace in the world of the gospel means salvation. It's the state of peace brought about by God's saving work through Jesus. Peace on earth. And so Jesus is not just saying, hello, at least I don't think he's saying hello. I think he's saying peace is here on earth amongst you and with you. And I find it interesting that, uh, as I mentioned before, having just exchanged resurrection stories, you know what it's like, don't you? When you're sitting down with friends and you tell a story and someone tells a story that's just slightly better than yours and then the next person tells a story that's like, oh that reminds me I, you know I, I and, and then suddenly the story is just well that's what was happening it's like we saw the well we saw the risen Jesus well Simon Peter saw the risen Jesus he appears and they doubt <laughs> they're swapping resurrection stories Jesus appears and they doubt and so there is hope for those of us who may at times doubt. Because Jesus doesn't dismiss their doubts. He doesn't just walk out of the room and go, sorry, sorry, wrong place, wrong people. Obviously, you're not the right kind of witnesses for me. If you don't believe me, what hope is there for the world? But thankfully, he doesn't say that. Instead, he demonstrates the reality of his bodily, physical resurrection to these doubting witnesses. So he invites them. He invites them to use their sight. Look at my hands and my feet. And he showed them his hands and his feet. And we assume that they must have still borne the scars of crucifixion. 
It's interesting, isn't it? Paul writes, we live by faith, not by sight. But Jesus knew that these folk, they needed to see. Then he invites them to touch. Touch me and see. And this is important because it doesn't matter what they saw, the fact that he had been physically raised needed to be proved by touch. Because the belief in ghosts still present today, we're still, we're still a society that believes very strongly in spirits separated from the body, it was very common then. In fact, it's one of the ways people thought, you know, that's life after death, this sort of separation of body from spirit. And, you know, we've got to be a bit careful. This is a whole other series, actually, that we could think about. But we've got to be careful as Christians that we don't fall into that trap, that the future life is the soul separated from the body. Because that's not what happened to Jesus. And it's not what's going to happen to us. And so Jesus needed them to, to witness the physicality, the, the, the bodily resurrection, the truth, that he was an embodied human being, not just a spirit visiting them. The human body is God's creation. You may not feel like it on some mornings when you get up and you're, oh, it's aching and tired, but the human body is God's creation. And we are, and we are destined to be embodied people now and in the life to come. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see, I have. So Jesus settles the value of the human body once and for all because he is embodied. And the third proof of his bodily resurrection may well be one of our favourites here at Chelsea Lane. He eats. That's a proof of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. He physically eats. And it's the second time he's offered food, according to Luke, since he was raised from the dead. Do you remember what he was offered first? According to Luke. So the word bread, bread on the road to, well, they were breaking bread. And that's when they recognised Jesus on the road to Emmaus. I know there are other gospel accounts where he has breakfast, but Luke, bread, if my memory serves me right, bread, and now he's being offered fish. Does that remind you of anything? Bread? And fish it reminds me of the feeding of the 5,000 where they had bread and fish but interestingly here it's the disciples offering it to Jesus those on the road to Emmaus must have had bread those here had fish and so in a way the disciples are the host of the table now and to some extent that's true of us when we as a church we invite people we, we are the host of this incredible Incredible opportunity. And then it's only, I like the, like the order here, it's only after he eats does he then open up the scriptures and reveal the truth about him. He realises the most important thing for them is to see the bodily resurrection. Then, when their eyes are opened, he opens scripture and he reveals the truth about him as revealed in the Old Testament. What a moment that must have been. Luke summarises it, so we don't know how long he speaks for, we don't know what he says, we know a big summary of it instead. But the summary itself is revealing. The Messiah must suffer. The Messiah will rise from the dead. And what follows that will be the preaching of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Do you know, as I get older and as I study more, I realise the gospel of Jesus Christ is much wider and deeper than we could ever give it credit. But any gospel you hear that doesn't reference the suffering physically as well as spiritually of Jesus, doesn't mention the physical resurrection of Jesus, and which doesn't call people to repent so that they may be forgiven, is actually not good news at all. Now, I'm not saying every time you speak a message from here, you need to incorporate all of those things. I don't. And even when Jesus spoke, he didn't. But the truth is that from us as a church, that's the core of our message. The reality that Jesus suffered, died, rose from the, again, rose from the dead physically, and that our task is a preaching of repentance 
so that people will know the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus says to the disciples, you are witnesses of these things. <coughs> what an interesting choice of witnesses. Not like me. <laughs> I was accurate. Bear with me here. I'm not saying that they were unreliable. But the words they record are reliable. Their characters as witnesses, we've got to be honest. A bit dubious. They had a history of being disloyal, some of them, if not all of them. They had a history of doubting. I mean, imagine if a police officer had sat down with Simon Peter and to record his testimony about Jesus. And then Simon Peter, was, uh, the, the police officer would say, hang about, weren't, weren't you the one who said you weren't with him? And now you're telling me you are with him. He's not exactly the greatest witness to Jesus, was he? And that's the incredible grace and the incredible mercy of God that they were chosen to be witnesses. And if you're thinking, Rob, you're reading too much into this. You're reading too much into this about their, in a, their, their, their role as witnesses. Actually, if you look in the Old Testament, God has got form we use the criminal word. God has got form with choosing disloyal, doubting people to be his witnesses. There's a passage which I haven't really noticed before until looking uh, through, the, the, through the words of Luke, and it comes from Isaiah. So God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And God says this, and he's saying this to his people. It's just lovely, isn't it? He's saying this to his people. I couldn't say this to you. But God could say this to his people. Hear you deaf, look you blind and see. Who is blind but my servant and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one in covenant with me? Blind like the servant of the Lord. You've seen many things, but you pay no attention. Your ears are open, but you do not listen. God isn't speaking about his servant Jesus. He's speaking about his servant Israel. He's actually talking about his own people. And there's much more to say in chapter 43, but I'm just going to summarize what Isaiah says, and you can look at it yourselves later. Isaiah, God through Isaiah then, then goes on after saying, this is what you're like. He then says, lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together, says God, and the peoples assemble. Which of their gods foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them, the other gods, bring in their witnesses to prove their right, so that others may hear and say it's true. It's God saying that. So again, I'm paraphrasing now. God is saying, okay, all you other gods, you, you bring in your witnesses. And your witnesses will, will say if you're right or not. And then God turns to his people and he says, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. It's a courtroom scene here that God is talking about through Isaiah. And we have the other gods bringing their witnesses in to testify to how great they are, and then God chooses his people, who he's just said are deaf, <laughs> they don't listen, and he's just said they're blind, they don't pay attention. Those are the people he pulls into the courtroom and says, you're my witnesses. God's words, not mine. Do you know why these people are witnesses for God? Because it sure ain't anything to do with their powers of observation. <laughs> Because he chose them. That's what he says in his word. I have chosen you as my witnesses. That's the great mercy and mystery of God. That he has bound himself to Israel through covenant love. And through the new covenant enacted through Jesus, he has bound himself to his church. And there is no plan B, no matter how bad 
they are at being witnesses. Christopher Wright writes this. He's a theologian. He's written a lot about the Old Testament. And he writes this. And the mission of God's people is not a matter of how great we are at doing things for God, but how patient and persistent God is in doing things through us. Fast forward to the New Testament, and Jesus says, you are witnesses of these things. Great. What things? What things? What things are they witnesses of? Well, the events that have just been retold. The birth of the Messiah. The suffering of the Messiah. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These first followers were literally eyewitnesses of those events. And their testimony would be all about Jesus and what he had said and done. And I can't emphasize how important this was to the early church. There was no slick publicity campaign. There was no social media strategy. The spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ was down to the plan of God, his Holy Spirit at work, and the faithful eyewitness testimony of those who had heard and those who had seen. When the disciples needed to find a replacement for Judas, the man who had betrayed Jesus, they were thinking, well, what, what should our minimum, minimum qualification be to join this elite group? What, 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 what qualifications? A Bachelor of Theology would be pretty good. Ten years of experience in church life would be fantastic. Public speaking, very useful skill. Conflict resolution, ideal skill. Nope. This is what the scriptures tell us when they were picking somebody. They were to choose one of the men who had been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So no qualifications other than they'd been there and they'd seen it. Now, okay, there may have been other qualifications as well, but that's the important one that scripture records. The replacement had to be an eyewitness to Jesus' life. That's who would replace Judas. It was the events the person had witnessed which qualified them to be a witness. It's pretty obvious, isn't it, when you think about it? You've seen and witnessed Jesus, you are in. You're part of it. And the gospel spread through the honest testimony of witnesses. Do you know, today... God is looking for witnesses. Men and women, boys and girls, who have seen God at work, who have heard him at work in their day, who have witnessed his power in their day. The Bible is a record of those first witnesses. The primary account of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, as witnessed by those who were there. Today, God is choosing people to be witnesses to the ongoing story of him at work in our world. And you'll be pleased to know that God doesn't choose people to be witnesses because they're great at telling stories or have a photographic memory or have a notebook that they record what their neighbours are doing. God chooses you Because you're there. If you've witnessed him at work, you're a witness, whether you like it or not. Chosen because they were there when prayer was answered. Have you known prayer was being answered? You're a witness. When these people go through the waters of baptism, were you there when you went through the waters of baptism? (laughs) I think you were. You're a witness. Were you there when you chose to follow Jesus? You were. You're a witness. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. And the gospel spreads through the honest testimony of witnesses. Let's pray.